I mean, okay. Um, I'm Arturo, I'm a second year economic student at UCL and I'm interested in investment banking and that's why I did my spring, spring weeks in. So I did spring weeks at Barclays and Bank of America and also Bloomberg, but that was global data, that was an investment banking. And I converted the Barclays spring week to a summer internship, which I'll be doing next year. So a lot of spring weeks, like the main interview stuff they do is just competency. And um, so yeah, so what are competency interviews? It's mainly just seeing like your personality and your skills and letting you sort of back it up. So what they want mainly is examples and um, a competency interview won't just be competency questions. So like it says that it usually starts off with one or two motivational questions, which is stuff like, I'll, I'll cover all of it later, but it's stuff like, um, you know, why do you want to do this? Um, why you're right for this? Why do you want to be in this company? I need to have questions that are sort of answers that are unique and sound believable. And, um, but I'm mostly going to be looking at competency questions, which is focusing on specific sort of personality traits and you proving them to the interviewer, basically. So um, looking firstly at sort of how I split up competency questions. So there's basically an easy version and a hard version. So the easy version is where they literally just ask you, show me about, like, tell me about a time you use leadership. And you just have like, you know, a story ready. You just talk a lot. Um, but they also have like, they can also ask about a specific situation and they don't say the competency they're talking about. You have to sort of infer it and then come up with a story that, you know, um, shows that you have the skill they're looking for. And so, so yes, yeah, put them up as here, specific competency and sort of specific situation. And this next slide is actually quite useful. So over the past year, I've done a lot of competency questions, whether it's like with an actual person or I've done, I must have done like 20 of like the ones where it's recorded and you're literally talking to a machine, which is hard at first, but you get used to it and you need to get used to it for springs, to be honest. Um, this is it, all the competencies that I've practiced for. This is pretty much like all the main ones. I think this covers just about everything. I would screenshot this. Um, I'll, I'll only ask you to screenshot like two things, this and the, I'll show you later. Um, so the main ones here, leadership and teamwork, you will always get these. I guess it's dumb how much these come up. So you need to have a leadership story and a teamwork story. They can't be the same story. Make sure that they may be a similar situation. Oh yeah, another thing, because you're going to get more than one competency question you never want to, you never want to reuse a situation too many times. Because when you're talking about leadership, say, um, and you're talking about, I don't know, sometime you led a group project, right? You don't want to reuse that example for a teamwork question. You want to, you want something new, something fresh. Or what I do, because I have some situations where it like covers a lot of competencies. So what I do is I try and like shift it on the timeline. So what I'll do is I'll be like, Oh, so at the start of X situation, I was in a much more um, like, you know, I was much more part of the team. And then I took on a more management role, like six months down the line. So you like split it up into like two different situations, even though it's the same thing. Um, so yeah, well, let's screenshot this. Um, the format of a competency question is pretty, so it can be for the like simple one where they just ask you about a competency. It would just be a, like, tell us about a time you had to use teamwork. Tell us about a time you had to innovate. Tell us about time X. And then you just, you just tell them about a time and you, I'll show you the, the start method and stuff in a moment. Uh, as for like situation ones, there's no format. You just have to kind of guess what they're asking for. So, and it can be like easy or hard. It depends. Like sometimes they'll be like, tell us about, you know, a situation where you had to lead a team. And now obviously that's teamwork. But then it can also be like, like what it says there, talk about a time you had to communicate detailed information, how you manage data and how you manage to communicate it. Like what even is that? So you have to, you know, figure out what they want. 
and just yeah you're going to have stories for each one of like this these so these are two examples i've actually got quite a few so these are just stuff i come across um throughout the past year and it's good to just have a list of these so when you're practicing for interviews you sit down you turn your camera on and you go through each competency again and again each one of these questions you need to make sure you have an example and like you know you need to be comfortable with these stories so here's a bunch more um you can kind of read through it for a minute just get a taste of what is like what sort of stuff they ask uh, some themes you'll see a lot apart from leadership and teamwork stuff like disagreements in the workplace conflict in the workplace um like juggling a lot of high pressure tasks i've got that one a lot so you need to have a story for like when you had a lot of stuff going on and how you but all they want to hear when and that they want to hear like how you organize yourself so i always say that before that i was sort of unorganized and then that experience made me like develop my organizational skills and that's how it should be for all of these you always have to say stuff like you know the experience you say you need to show them that it helps you develop whatever competency they're looking for so not only like do you have it but like you're working on it that sort of stuff so yeah i mean take a screenshot of this um it's good to just like go through all of these so now we're going on to this i'm sure um some of you have heard of this uh so it's basically a um a format to answer these questions now i mean it's pretty simple like if you're talking about, say, you led a group project at school and you were investigating profitability of wind turbines, right? What was the problem? Um, we needed to find like a, a solution to this wind turbine problem. What you needed to do, we needed to sort of assemble a team, like um, find all the data, compile it, present it. How did you do it? And usually the action bit is sort of the longest bit you talk about, right? And um, you talk about like how you did it, like um, any sort of obstacles you had to overcome, anything like that. But make sure throughout the whole thing that you're emphasizing how you're proving X competency, teamwork, leadership, whatever, right? And the end bit result, you just you want to quantify it. You want to say, um, in the end, our group project came second out of three hundred or whatever, right? And you wanna you wanna show how your how this competency actually reflects in your results, how it reflects in how you actually did. Um, when I started out, a lot of it was like I saw star everywhere. It's like it's very common. Everybody does it. Um, I like at the end after result, I like evaluating it. So after when you do the result afterwards, you say how you would have done something differently. And in my experience, they really like that. And not that many people do that. And that sort of differentiates you from the rest of the, you know, 90% of applicants that are just doing star. So make, call that stare if you want evaluation at the end. So you'll be like, in hindsight, maybe we should have planned the, um, plan, plan the, um, if we're talking about the wind turbine thing, like plan the, um, the timeline of how we would do the project just say something that you know it makes it and if you can link it to the competency they're asking for even better but yeah that's like a it'll, it'll look good if you do that um i use that all the time um, but i mean it doesn't matter if you just do star um that's fine as well as long as you have a structure this goes for anything like as, as long as your answer is structured and it sounds like you thought it out without thinking it out if that makes sense like it sounds like you thought about it beforehand but it still flows naturally they they love that as well yeah so um so this sort of lets me talk about the approach so this the way like i prepared for interviews if anyone has any questions by the way i'm going too fast let me know um so the way i prepare for comp interviews i kind of mentioned it before you pretty much just go through each competency and you make sure you have a story that reflects that. And if you do that and you do it lots of times, and I recommend sitting in front of the camera recording yourself, because that'll give you some of the stress that you're gonna have like when you actually do it. And then kind of watching it back, seeing if you have you know, any nervous ticks or any stuff that you don't want on camera. Um, that'll help you improve 
And doing that, not just for the competencies, but also for these sort of situation specific questions, I find that, and once you've done a couple interviews, you like, you find that you always default to like four or five stories and everyone has that like four or five stories they can use for anything. Like they'll ask them anything. It's very rare that you won't, they'll ask you something that you won't have an answer to. Um, and in that case, like you just kind of have to improvise, but I definitely recommend for your first interviews, you come in sort of um, prepared for any question. Cause like, um, especially like for my first interview, I spent literally three days just making sure I had a perfect answer for every question. And, um, and that sort of means that now, like later down the line, you won't, cause you've had all that experience. You have your stories that you know work and you don't need to do that like a million time repetition. You just have the stories you always default to. And I think that's definitely one of the better ways to approach sort of getting good at competency interviews. But at the end of the day, it's just practice, like it says there. Um, and yeah, no, it's really important to have your story and put it in a star format. I think that's the way to ace these. And yeah, make sure it's relevant uh, and make sure you don't repeat the story. I think that's the best, um, that's the best approach in my opinion. Um, moving on to what's next. <coughs> Sorry, um, motivational questions. So at the beginning, so this, this whole thing's meant to be about competency questions, but the truth is in a competency interview, you're gonna have motivational questions at the start. And um, they're all, they're, I would say they're the most important thing because for me at least, making sure you nail these gets the ball rolling for the rest of the interview. If you nail these, the motive, like the sort of um, momentum you get is really good because they're like the first questions you ask. And if you mess them up, that's going to be on your mind for the rest of the interview. So making sure you have this perfect answers for why this role, why this company is, you know, like the amount of time I spent on why this role, why this company is, you know, it's insane. You need to have good answers for those. Um, usually the, I don't really know what's written here, I kind of forgot what I wrote, but the main advice is have two or three points that, um, that are unique to you. So for me, when I talk like for Barclays, I think I did the scale of the impact I could have, um, how much Barclays uses technology, because that interests me, and sort of my understanding of its culture from talking to people. So the only one there which isn't that generic to Barclays would be the scale of the impact you can have, right? Because you can just change the name to any big bank. And um, so I don't recommend that point, but it's true to me. So like I, I use it all the time. Um, and that, yeah, those are for me. Like you will have different things, maybe, maybe not, I don't know. Um, but having good answers to those is really important. I'd recommend just like um, talking to people just reaching out to people on LinkedIn, trying to find like unique stuff about the bank, uh, doing your research are really important. If you get like an in-person interview, like doing a lot of, not in-person, but on the, you know, Zoom or whatever, or in-person now, like going through the banks, like news, like going through, cause they do like research reports. They do a lot of stuff. Just try and figure out as much as you can. You basically want to act like you work there. That's sort of the, you want to, yeah. So that's motivational questions. And why this, so that's why this, why this role is pretty much the same. You want two or three points that um, are, are sort of unique to you. So like why investment banking, you want to say stuff that interests you. Like for me, I think I said, um, I think, <clears throat> so the impact you can have was a big one. Um, sort of the analytical challenge was another one. And I also use the sort of high pressure environment and how I work better in, under high pressure. But like I said, it's going to be different for everyone. So that's it for motivational. I mean, if you have any questions, just either now, later, or on LinkedIn, just message me. It's, uh, I'm not going to spend too much time on motivational and, and strength base. Here we go. So here's the next one. I haven't actually had that many of these. Um, and you, I don't think you'll get that many of them at spring level. Um, maybe I've had, I don't think I've ever had one in an actual like in-person interview, like on the phone or whatever. 
you do get them sometimes in like um, the higher view stuff, which is basically recorded interview. And also some banks where like some answers are written, they'll ask you about some of these as well. So here they're just trying to find like um, what your strengths and weaknesses are. And you pretty much, a lot of people, I mean, this is common knowledge now, it's almost cliche, but a big piece of advice is don't, um, don't say a weakness that's actually a strength, like, oh, I work too hard. Shut up, no, you don't. Um, you want like strengths that, um, you want strengths that are actually your strengths, but are also relevant to the role. Don't tell them you're good at canoeing, they don't care. Weaknesses, you want stuff which isn't relevant to the role, but it's true. So for investment banking, at least, you can say like, um, you can't say I'm bad at numbers, but you can say, um, I don't like talking in front of huge audiences in person because you don't need to do that. They don't care. And it's something you can work. Oh, big piece of advice. Always say that it's something you're working on as well. Like, oh, when I join Toastmasters, I'm practicing my public speaking. And that's pretty much how you nail it. Um, the strength and weaknesses question. And other stuff like, do you prefer the big picture or the small details? That depends on your role. And it, I mean, it also depends on yourself. But if you want to give the right answer, it kind of depends on like your role. If you're a trader, you probably want to do the small details because you can't be, I mean, same with investment banking, actually. Um, uh, detail oriented is always good. Um, and stuff like, oh, I never got the how do you define success question, but that's a rough question if you're not prepared for it. So I threw it in there um, in case they don't catch you off guard. Oh. Um, no, honestly, I'm not even sure how you answer that. It's really like personal to you. Um, I would say like setting goals and achieving them. And that's, yeah. So strength-based questions, that's that. Uh, I don't have a slide for brain teasers because it's not a big deal at spring level, but you will get a few. I've got a few um, for my Barclays conversion interview. I got one. Um, I got quite a few, and the reason, and like one of the reasons I converted was because I did them pretty well. And this is stuff like uh, <sighs> I wrote a few of them down. Let me put them up. Uh, I don't know if uh, you probably can't see that, but um, how many cows are there in England? How many light bulbs are there in London? The one I got asked, I, I got asked these two. It would be funny. It would be nice to see if someone gave it a go. How many people go through Waterloo on a work day between 7 a.m. and 9 a.m.? And um, if you had a cube made of 10 by 10 by 10 smaller cubes, and you, you know what? I'm going to share the screen because. Is, you, and there aren't that many, but you might as well take a screenshot where are they are. Uh, I actually got a few of these, so you might as well. Um, yeah. Um, does anyone want to try these? Because it's always funny getting someone to try these. I, I will pick on someone. Don't. Uh, LMM. Which, uh, so which one? Can I try the second one? This one? Yeah. Go for it, yeah. Um, you know, so I think there's nearly 9 million people in London. And uh, I think there's probably more than two people in each household. So I'm guessing there's probably like 4 million households in London. Um, um, so I'm probably going to guess. Um, um, I'm obviously going to look at our house. A two-bedroom house probably has a light bulb in each bedroom, so that's two. There's probably a light bulb in the kitchen, so that's three. Uh, there's probably a light bulb in the bathroom, so that's four. And there's probably one in the entrance as well. So I'll probably say, um, I'll probably say five, five, uh, five light bulbs times four million. So I'll probably uh, five light bulbs times four million. So I'll probably say that there is twenty million light bulbs in London. Okay. What about street lamps? Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yeah, it's tricky. What about hospitals, schools? What about um, car lamps, like car headlamps? You know, um, the thing is, like, they're not uh, they're not like, good work by the way, but they're not um, they're not looking for the right answer. They're just looking 
you know, how fast you can do the maths. But that's not the main thing. They're just looking at your logical, like your logical reasoning. They're trying to see how many different, you know, things you can do. And maybe I should have done a slide on this because there's um there's two ways you can approach these questions. So there's some, there's a top down approach and a bottom up approach. So take um take how many people go through Waterloo on a work day. Um, the top down approach would be to start with the total number of tube um like tube um visits per day or the total number of people in London, a big number. I think the total number of tube per, um, things per day is like 5 million. You do end up just learning random facts. Um, and then you have to like break it down further. Okay, so how many of those would be Waterloo? How many of those would be on a work day? How many of those would be seven to nine? And you keep making that number smaller until you get your answer. Or you go from the bottom up, which is what I did for that question, where you like, you figure out, how many people in a carriage, how many, um, you can like, you can kind of pull numbers out of thin air to be honest. So you can say, oh, there's five stations in Waterloo. There's probably not, there's probably a lot, a lot more, but you just kind of just, they just want to see your like reasoning, right? So you say there's five um, thingies and then you say um, the train comes every 20 seconds. And then you say each train has five carriages and each carriage has 40 people in rush hour, something like that. And then you, you add it all up small numbers and you get a big number and that's um that's bottom up if you're lucky they'll let you use a calculator but i would advise you to just practice your mental maths this isn't a big deal for springs um i got a few though and for conversion they might ask you a few because they don't expect you to be good at technical so they want to see how else you're smart right uh, uh Arturo, so we did have a question which asks are these brain teaser questions common in spring weeks? But you kind of answered it. So how common actually are they? Um, so in application, not that common. I can think of two times when I got them and I applied to like 30 plus places. And I, th I, th I think Macquire had one, which was, it was something about telephones in London. I, th I don't even remember, but, um, and there was another place. But in applications, you won't get them that much. In conversion, I see them more often. And I'm not sure about in at internship application level. Um, but yeah, but in conversion, you'll get them more. So it's, you don't need to do it now, but just be aware that's a thing. Does anyone want to try this one? Where is it? <laughs> no one? No, I will pick. It's good. There's like two ways to do it. And I got, I actually got asked this, was it Bank of America? I got asked this, so. Oh wait. I don't mind trying. Go on, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah go for it. Um, okay, well, you've got a 10 by 10 by 10 smaller cubes. So if you take one side of a cube face, You've got a thousand small faces. Yeah, wait. Of a cube. You got a thousand if you take one side. Yeah, ten by ten by ten. Oh, okay. Well one yeah, one side's a hundred, but yeah, yeah, one big side, yeah. You've got okay, six okay. faces on the big cube, so you've got six thousand yeah, yeah, yeah. smaller cube faces. Um, and then you know that um these smaller cubes have six faces so then you divide it by six again and surely then you've just painted a thousand cubes small cubes um, the thing is can i try this um yeah go for it uh this is a guess but um so if you take a 10 by 10 by 10 smaller cubes um and you paint the outside um you need to add up all of the um sides of the cubes minus the ver um, vertices, I think. So that will be 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100 plus 100, which is 100 times six, um, 600 minus eight, which is 592, I think. Uh, so you're closer, you're on the right track. Remember that um, on the edge of the cube, do I have a cube there? No, I don't have a cube there. Oh, right, the edges as well, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
And yeah, the corners have three faces on them, and the edges right, yeah. have two. So this is a lot more like um, taking away. You have to do the way I did it first. Is um, I um. So you have ten by ten by ten by ten. I took the middle bits because I know there's only one face painted on those. So the middle bits of each thing, and so that would be um eight by eight times six. And then I took the corners. So there's one, two, uh, wait, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. And you know that those are eight long because you don't want to include the corners. I mean the edges. Sorry, yeah, you don't want to include the corners. And um, you know those are eight long and they have two. And then you do the same for the edges that have three, and you'll get four hundred and eighty-eight. But then he asks me, um, think of another way to do it. And I was like, what? It took me like a while. And then um, there's a really easy way to do it, which is um, you do it the other way around. So you find out how many cubes don't have paint on them. And, that, and you think of it as a cube within a cube, right? So that the outside layer all has paint on it. But the inside layer, which is an eight by eight by eight block, has no paint on it. So you just do 10 to the power of three minus eight to the power of three. Um, big cube minus small cube, and you get the number of painted cubes. If anyone doesn't get that, let me know. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's enough. Um, stop torturing you with um. Uh, oh, <coughs> I think we finished a bit early. Any questions? So if any of you have questions, uh, feel, please feel free to ask. And if you want to join Clio, you know, um, just reach out to us or go look on our LinkedIn page and you can register to join Clio if any of you aren't with us already. Um, so if anyone doesn't have questions, I'll just get the ball rolling. Um, so Arturo, what do you sort of do when you freeze on a question and you don't really know how to answer it and you're just stuck? Um, so it's good to, this is actually like some people very sneaky people, what they do is they pretend to mess up on a question, no, not me, and then they pause for like five seconds and they recompose themselves. And that looks really good just because it shows that they can pick themselves up after failing. I never done that, but I know that people have done that. And um, and you pretty much have, you pretty much do that, but for real. So you just pause, think about like what you want to say. It's also, you can like ask questions to buy time. Like you can like ask for specifics. And um, if you really do freezing, you've literally got nothing to say. I mean, it's not a good look, but I mean, you can be honest with them and just say, I can't think of, um, and you can always like, if they ask, oh, tell me about a time you had a bad interaction with a customer, you can always spin it. Like I've never, like I never really had a bad interaction with a customer. So I use that client instead or something like that. You can always spin it different ways. It's fine. Um, but yeah, just pause, think about it for a moment, try and buy time until you've got the answer you want. Uh, anyone else have any other questions maybe uh, that have sprung into their mind from that? Don't be shy, guys. You know, if you really do have questions, do yeah. ask him. To be fair. Stuff. Like if, if I, um, to be fair, you guys already know it about spring weeks and stuff. Like I found out about spring weeks in like late September, like when I came to uni. So you're already like, you know, ahead and having an opportunity to ask someone who's already done it is always good. So they should just ask me about anything, like other people nice and spring weeks, like literally anything you can ask whatever you want, I don't mind. How early would you recommend preparing for interviews um, for spring weeks? Uh, yesterday, like get on it. <laughs> but, um, um, uh, you should really be applying. There's like five, like, oh, big piece of advice. I told this to Christos as well. The most important thing is to apply like early. You always want to, you never want to apply late. Like apply like the week it opens, the day it opens. And um, yeah, make sure you're preparing like soon, like now. Yeah, that'll, that'll put you ahead of like, I mean, put you ahead of most people but i'm sure there's lots of people that have already started preparing and are already on it so yeah and um, sarah asked a question um, in the chat it says how many questions do they ask you okay so for depends but um for like recorded interviews they'll ask you something like 
three, five. I think the most I got was nine. Um, and that's just where they like the robot asks you questions and you just talk to them. Uh, for like telephone interviews, it's a little more, I think they can ask you like, <laughs> they expect you to talk more. Um, but uh, maybe, I mean, it depends as well, but maybe like six, seven. So there'll always be the two like motivational stuff, why Bank of America, why investment banking. And then they'll ask you stuff like, um, tell me about a time leadership, tell me about this, tell me. Then after like leadership and teamwork, which is always, it's always going to be there pretty much. They're going to ask you like a bit more specific stuff. Tell me about a time you had to display complex information, stuff like that. And then um, a few more random questions. And then at the end, they're going to ask you stuff like, uh, well, they're going to expect you to ask a question. And you need to have um, two, I recommend two questions, which are good. And make sure it's about them, about the actual interviewer. Because, you know, people love talking about themselves. So you just get them to do that. But yeah, it depends. Each one is different for each company. But for like the higher views, which is what you're going to be doing mostly, which is recorded interviews, um, it's going to be a lot of um, like five, three questions sort of stuff. But yeah. Um, okay, we've got a question from Chitan. I don't know if I understand the question. I will give it a go. Um, I want to go into accounting and finance. So would you recommend doing spring weeks and internships in industry or practices? I don't know what the old practices bit means. Um, um, <laughs> me neither. But, Chita, do you want to clarify that? But um, I think, yeah, I would recommend doing as much experience as you can. Um, um, yeah, I'm just not sure what you mean by practices, but if you mean like doing placement yeah i don't know but um do as much it's really good to like the main advice for like spring weeks is i'll do it to explore your options but it also really looks really good when applying to internships so make sure you get on this like early make sure you get something so that um it looks good later on depending on what you want to do it's just good to see like what it's about as well but the truth is you can find out about like most stuff online like Afsal Hussein, like on YouTube, he has like a bunch of videos on a lot of industries. Great, um, great to look at. What's the next question? Oh, she she clarified. Um, practice as in like more technical firms, like consulting firms, um, rather rather in industry oh. like Disney or other magic companies, major companies. Yeah. Okay. Um. So, as for like spring weeks, um. You're not going to find spring weeks at like Disney, but you will find them at like KPMG, EY, Deloitte. Um, so at this level, and I mean, those are accounting firms. Having those on your CV looks really good if you want to go into accounting or finance or whatever. But the truth is like I applied to, I, I think I'm pretty sure I applied to L'Oreal. Like they had a spring week for like, for like finance and accounting. I don't even know how you pronounce that. It's like a makeup thing or something and um like just apply everywhere you can and the more the better you know it doesn't look bad uh i hope i answered your question if you do want like more clarification just dm me on linkedin it's fine yeah, uh, our next question is from neha and she asks if your interviewer is with an is an actual investment banker should you show your personality more i think um one of the best pieces of advice i got was to actually be yourself a lot of people try to be like someone that not try to like make it look like they're someone. I think just show, obviously, you know, don't, I don't know, like don't swear, like obviously within reason, but be, um, you know, be who you are. I think it's more important to show your personality when it's with some person in HR, because they're like, you know, they have to go through like 500 people, probably 500 calls. They need, you need to stand out a little bit. You need to, you know, if you can, if you can, if you can't, doesn't matter, but it's better if you can, like, you know, make them laugh. I know it's generic advice, but um, just be, you know, be nice, be yourself. Um, if it's with a banker, I mean, it's always good to show your personality, but I wouldn't say it would help more or not. In fact, my interviews with bankers is usually, it's more stressful and, um, uh, I mean, it's good to show, but I mean, you're, you're kind of focusing on the questions. You're not even focusing on showing personality. But yeah, how do you get better at those online tests? Um, so my advice is 
oh, and there's another one there too, but okay, I'll start with um, online tests. So job test prep, I don't know how many of you have heard of that. Um, it's good to get into a group of like seven of you, eight of you, and buy the three month subscription and just bang those out personally they they aren't actually enough like it's i mean it's the only thing you can do to be honest with you i think assessment day is another one but job test prep is the big one um personally it's not even enough to like but it, it definitely helps you improve but they need more tests on that but it's still good um so yeah i recommend job test prep to um to sort of it definitely helps it definitely helps and you want to be aiming for like high high numbers on that I think they usually do it out of 10. You want to get like 9, 10, stuff like that. And do interviewers expect us to have significant knowledge of finance? No, that's the point of a spring week. But if you have knowledge of what's going on right now in regards to finance, if you read the Financial Times, um, which you should get through university, hopefully, uh, that, will, that will make you look good when they ask. Um, tell me one recent event about this and that'll make you look good um and yeah i mean if you actually care about finance you might as well be like you might as well get into like reading news about it so you know what's going on and stuff like that um also some universities have discounts of job test prep so you might want to look into that as well um let's see what else we've got what's the latest you think we should apply since my cv currently is a bit lacking i'm waiting to add you need to add stuff hmm. um I, I i just applied straight i tried because i was late i i was um also societies to me they're like a bit of a waste of time like unless you're unless it's very related to what you want to go into it won't look that like impressive um and also like it's just long on the whole society thing um i like when i got here i just applied straight away because i was really late i started applying in like like early october and um yeah i didn't wait for that if you if you know that you can get maybe like a first year rep and you know you can get it fast maybe hold off a bit i know a lot of people that did that if you're applying for i don't know like i don't know something called like social media manager at the tennis club it's not gonna i don't know um so yeah i mean it's, it's, it's up to you i mean there's also like some people there's different strategies for this like some people say um don't apply to the big banks when they open do all the smaller worse they're not worse but smaller banks um some people say worse or not um like the elite boutiques i don't know if you guys know about those the um basically like ones that just focus entirely on this is for investment banking i'm talking about um and um, basically, ones that basically apply to stuff you don't want them as much, you don't want as much first, so that then you're good at application for the ones you do want. Yeah, it's not a matter of what's better or worse or anything like that. Um, and so that's another strategy. I would say, what, what do I recommend? I recommend just applying early, but someone would say differently. So it's up to you if you think you can get. Depends on your uni as well. Some uni start later, some uni start earlier. Um, it depends if you think you can get a role early on and maybe save it for the better banks. Man. But yeah, um, did you apply to front office? Just front office. Um, I mean, maybe it would apply to technology. Uh, like I know at JP Morgan, you can apply to as many as you want. And I didn't know that. I just applied to IB. Um, but I would have applied to tech as well because I'm interested in tech, but mainly front office. I just, um, yeah. See what else we got. What kind of assessment test did you do before reaching the actual interviews? I'll get to Elements' question in a second, wait. Um, <laughs> yeah, so Arturo, I'm just wondering, uh, you, men you mentioned JP Morgan, so I'm just wondering what divisions do they offer for spring weeks? Uh, God, um, so they have like, um, they have programs which are for some specific groups of people. Like I think they have a minority one, a female one, and then they also have I think just straight. I think they have investment banking because some some banks right they put investment banking and um, markets together <clears throat> and just give you like an overview of everything. I'm not sure if JP Morgan does that. You can literally like I'm pretty sure you can look it up. 
but I know they do tech, um, IBD, and I definitely do like some like minority specific stuff, I'm pretty sure. But yeah, um, I hope that answers your question. I'm pretty sure you can like legitimately, yeah. yeah. Um, also, I know that a lot of people, yeah, a lot of people just like apply to everything there, just to, just to try and get, um, you literally just need a CV, it's so easy to apply to JP Morgan. But anyway, yeah. Um, I hope that answered your question. If not, um, DM me. What kind of assessment tests did you do before reaching the actual interviews? Um, so non-verbal, verbal, numerical, and um, SJT, which is social social judgment. I think it's situational judgment test. That's the one. I knew it was judgment. Situational judgment test. Um, so it's so nonverbal is going to be like they're going to give you shapes and you have to match up the shapes, that sort of thing. Verbal is going to be they're going to give you a wall of text and you need to decipher as much as you can in the time limit. And numericals are usually going to be financy stuff like it's, it's dead easy, like percentages, stuff like that. What makes it hard is the, the timing. Uh, the timing's horrible. That's what gets most people. Um, but yeah, uh, you can practice the first three. So um, nonverbal, verbal, numerical pretty easily. I find that um, situational judgment, that's quite hard to practice. They're going to like, they'll put you in a situation and they'll give you like a few options and they'll basically get you to like rank them or say what's best, what's worse. And I mean, I want to say be yourself. I think that's the right advice. Like, just do what you do. Do what you do if you're not, you know, you're trying to be a good employee. You know, that's kind of the best advice I got for you. Um, no problem. No problem. With C C harm. I think that's how you pronounce your name. Uh, how many firms should we apply to? If I do a lot, then I won't be focusing. But if I choose to apply to a couple, then my chances is getting them lower. I mean, I'm gonna tell you to do as many as you can. Um, that's my advice. Um, I pretty much, um, I kind of like didn't do university for the first term. Like I kind of just didn't do it. Um, like if I had an exam, I'd just grind it out the few days before and just do it. I didn't go to lectures or anything. I just, uh, I'm not gonna say I just work the whole time. I didn't, I definitely didn't just work the whole time, but um, uh, but like uh, I was basically just focused on my applications and uh, yeah, doing fun stuff. How many firms should we apply to? Oh yeah, I just read that. So yeah, just do as many as you can and try and come up with a system where it's a quality application each time. So come up with like a cover letter that you can swap out bits and pieces um, to make it original, but not that much effort. So you want to make it so specific to the firm. You can't write, you cannot write a cover letter but if you change the name of the bank, you can just change the name of the bank. You can't do that. It looks horrible. You need to have like bank specific stuff in there. So my cover letter template is um like why the bank, why the division, why me, and um the why the bank paragraph. Pretty like the structure is the same, but I pretty much rewrite it the whole time, like um most of the time. And like I include awards, the bank score, stuff that makes it stand out, like charity initiatives, stuff that matters to me. And the why the division paragraph, you I always like talk about a deal the bank has been involved in. Um, so I always I literally have a section where I just put in a, re a recent deal that looks interesting. Um, and so that way I sort of have like I'm not going to say it's like completely customized to every bank because it is technically a structure that I use for all of them, but it means I can apply to like 30 of them and it's like a decent application each time, not decent, but better than decent, you know. I would advise it's a numbers game. Apply to as many as you can. Um, how many finance firms are there? Uh, quite a few. Uh, it depends on what you want to do. But I'm guessing you don't know at this point. So just apply to everything. Um, you have the big banks, um, they're called bulge brackets. And there's about um, Goldman Sachs, JP Morgan, Morgan Stanley, uh, Barclays, UBS. HSBC, Credit Suisse, Deutsch. Um, that is eight, eight. Um, and then you have a bunch of like elite boutiques where they just focus on investment banking and advisory services. 
and there's a few of those, but there aren't that many springs for that. And then, I mean, all firms have like, like, like L'Oreal isn't a finance firm, but they have a spring where, you know, it doesn't really count. But uh, there's a couple trading ones, like Opt Optiva has a trading spring week, I think, Optiva, I don't know how you say that. But um, there's a lot of finance firms. It also depends on what, like investment banking, trading, accountancy, consultancy. I didn't do any consultancy. And there's also like, there's a million law spring weeks. I don't know anything about that. But if you're into law, check them out. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of finance firms. Cheers. Thank you, Shabak. Um, Thank you, Arthur. Do you have any tips for cover letters? I'm absolutely terrible at writing in general, so I know I'm gonna to struggle to write those. That was me as well, coming into coming into uni. I didn't know anything about anything. I didn't know what a bank was. I knew what a bank was, but I didn't know what an investment bank was. Um, you want a structure. I mean, if you want like specific tips, DM me on it on, on Instagram. <laughs> DM me on LinkedIn. Um, but um, follow like a format like you want to actually want why the um it doesn't have to be in this precise order some people do it differently but the one i see the most is why the company why the division and why you and you want to make it like sort of specific and then the why me you just get to you always keep the why me the same you just flex i think that's it um if you do want like more just yeah linkedin um how many words should a CV be? There isn't a word limit on CVs. Um, it will be more compact than most people's CVs if it's good because you want your CV to be on one page and usually it's a struggle to get it on one page. So there's gonna be, it'll look kind of dense, but it has to be readable, obviously. Um, and a couple CV tips, just yeah, quantify everything. So make it, don't, split, don't use a lot of fancy vocabulary, just say, Instead of saying, um, you know, I'm not going to come with an example, but instead of saying, so like, just say a number, you know, how, what the effect you had what was with a number and try and keep it short, short and sweet. So you can put lots of stuff in there. Um, is it okay if I don't have any experience with finance on my CV? Obviously it looks good because it shows interest. If you manage to show interest another way, that will look um, good as well. So experience, finance experience looks good only because it shows interest. That's all they care about. They just want to see that you're interested and you're motivated. Um, if you don't have any experience, um, just try and find experience other ways. So join societies, um, do like courses, what are like literally anything that shows that you are interested in finance to sort of make up for that, right? And even if you have experience in finance, you're not like you need to show interest anyways, right? Um, is it possible to apply for spring days spring days if I don't have any work experience in year 12? Yeah, I mean, this is it's kind of what spring weeks are for, you know, it's like to get experience. Um, just make sure you show interest, whether it be on your CV and your cover letter, you need to, they need to be a, you know, damn well sure that like you're interested in that. During your spring weeks, did you get a feeling that everyone was competing against each other? Yeah, but not in like uh, okay i mean the pet so at barclays it was only a one day thing usually it's like a like a whole week but because of covid they made it a one day thing uh wait okay wait uh and so i mean it's not that everyone's competing with each other but you're meant to ask questions to show interest in a spring week and um everyone was like trying to get in to ask questions people would put their hand up like an hour before question time just to get a question in and so that was kind of like a you know it's, i mean you needed to do it if you wanted to like convert right you needed to show interest so um it's sort of like equivalent in real life imagine you're a room you're giving a presentation and you know all 50 people put their hands up that's how i felt um but no it was good like it wasn't bad i actually learned some interesting stuff and Bank of America, it was longer. I think I did the whole week. And that wasn't that. Like, obviously, everybody wants to put their question in, but it was a bit more chill. Bloomberg was completely chill. Even though we were competing, like, it felt like it wasn't it was chill at all. Bloomberg has a very nice culture, but it's also Bloomberg. Like, it's a, good, it's a great company, don't get me wrong. They do really interesting stuff there, but it's not the field I wanted to go into. So I just did it to see what it was about. Um, but no, great place. I can recommend Bloomberg. But, um, 
But yeah, I mean, obviously, it's not competing against each other, but everyone's motivated. That's how it's sum that up. Um, I got a scene map. 12 firms let me apply. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. Uh, it should be fine. Um, sometimes they ask for like a minimum UCAS tower. You're fine. It's fine. Don't worry. Um, uh, yeah. Sure. I don't remember any sort of grade barrier, like boundaries, but it definitely wasn't like, it definitely wasn't C. If any, it would maybe it'd be like D or E or something. I don't know. I think you'll find that. Don't worry. Um, do you just say, actually, I mean, it's too early to say it's been well at uni, but it, it, don't worry about it. It's fine. Um, do you recommend wearing smart clothing during a high view? Yeah, all the time I wear a white shirt, um, tie, and a jacket. Um, people say, some people say, um, you know, wear the bottom half as well, but I wear my pajamas. Actually, I don't wear my pajamas. Okay, I do, but anyway, just, yeah, wear well, whatever you want on the bottom. Um, is it possible to do a higher view without a stable internet connection? Um, yeah, I mean, I don't think I've had this issue. Um, you might want to, I mean, if you're moving to university, you might want to speed that up because... It's, it's probably I think you can because it's not like it's not streaming it's just like a back and forth they'll give you a question you record your answer you get some up right so hopefully it doesn't give you any problems if it does you can let them know they definitely will be accommodating um uh <clears throat> like I think I had a problem with my Bloomberg test they made us do like a programming test and I had like a, I had some issue, a technical issue with it. And they, um, actually, wait, that's a bad example because I, I sent them an email and they didn't actually give me a reply, but I, but I got the thing. So I'm sure they looked at it and they're like, okay, that's cool. Um, you prefer high views of actual interviews. You might be a psychopath. It's kind of hard because the thing is, when I'm talking, you probably noticed this whole time I haven't looked at the camera once because it's just a piece of plastic. I'm just looking around. But when there's someone in front of you, you're like, you're looking at them. That's the only thing. And it just feels like you're talking to yourself sometimes. But, um, do spring weeks pay? Some do, most don't. I think Goldman might, not a lot. Um, most don't. So um, it's more for experience and pays in the long run, put it that way. Some banks give you allowances. Is that, what's that about? Are you prepared for the long hours of being an investment bank? Um, <clears throat> um, prepared for the long hours. Uh, I don't think, I don't know if anyone's ever prepared for the long hours. I mean, I, I don't mind working late at night, but um, I mean, I kind of have to, I haven't done it yet. You know, it's like, it's going to be, obviously it's rough, but you don't do it forever. Like you only do it for a few years and then things get better. Even if you like go up the ladder, if you go do something else, it's fine. Um, but I mean, I, I don't mind working late at night. I kind of like it, you know, for your coffee and yeah. Do you apply for a, what is the hourly pay of investment bankers roughly? I mean, if you, if you take into account the, amount you work is probably not as impressive as people make it out um but it's more about the exit opportunities and the experience and the stuff you learn um i know we're getting close to the time but i'll answer all the questions i've literally got nothing to do today um did you apply for a technical role at bloomberg because they made you do a programming test yes i applied to global data because that's why um i like data and tech and stuff um, yeah, the programming test had some Python, some SQL, and a few maths stats questions. Um, nothing too hard if you are into computer science, but if you're not, you have no idea what's going on. Um, no, I meant for some spring weeks. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, Bank of America was meant to give me an allowance, but instead I had to give it to charity because of COVID. I'm not mad, I'm just, I do economics. Um, oh, is that other questions? Nice. Do you have any other questions? Uh, if anyone's got any other questions, uh, please feel free to ask. We have about two minutes left, but 
as Arturo said, he's happy to continue and answer any extra questions you have got. You guys have got over time. Um, okay, I'll, I'll just throw one in there. How, how did you kind of get yourself a uh, conversion? How, how was the process, and how did you how them? So it's um, it's an interview like any interview. Uh, so for Barclays, the conversion process was two interviews back to back. One was a technical and one was a actual, not actual, a competency, what we just did basically. So technical was a case study. They gave you something, you had 20 minutes to look at it, and then you had to answer some questions about it. What happens if you fail the conversion interview? I'll tell you actually. Um, uh, the, uh, so that, that's what it was for Barclays. And I mean, it's pretty straightforward. Um, technical, you won't have done before. But I mean, there's nothing, you don't really need to prepare. You just need to know some basic like accountancy, like what's revenue, right? You need to know that, you need to know stuff like, they kind of asked me, they are, well, not me, but they asked some of my friends um, stuff like, what's the current LIBOR interest rate? You know, you need to, you might need to conversion from spring to um, summer internship, see how. Um, and for Bank of America, I didn't get converted here. Um, I asked for advice and they said, you did everything perfectly, but we only converted like four people. So yeah, that sucks. But um, that was a technical one, which was hard. It was very like, they asked me, like I went above and beyond in preparing. I did stuff like DCF and um, that's discounted cash, but you do not need to know that. Um, but you will find out about it if you go into investment banking. They asked me um, some like complex questions about that. And then it was two competency interviews, which funnily enough had no competency questions. Um, it was just like motivational and just quizzing me on my CV. Um, if you fail the conversion interview, you don't get this stuff. But then you can apply when everyone else applies. It's not like um, it's not the end of the world. And if you have a spring on your CV, it looks a lot better. So yeah. Um, did I answer the question? What's going on? Any other questions? Does Elamin have a question? Um, yes, yeah, so I'm just wondering for the Bank of America Spring Week, how many people were doing the Spring Week and that? What percentage of them converted? I don't know the exact percentage, but I know that um, it was very low this year. I know that um, there was like 40 people on that, maybe. It was, so there's like different divisions and stuff, and you don't know who's in what division, but I mean, I think you honestly, I think a fair bet is like 30 to 40 people in most spring weeks. Um, I think, yeah, it's probably that's a fair bet. And um, I know that Barclay is a higher percentage converted, like quite high. I think, well, I don't know what it was this year, but most years it's like 70. Bank of America is usually like decent as well, but this year they just, I don't know what happened. Yeah. But I mean, it is, was, yeah. was someone named Travis in your spring week? Um, maybe. I mean, there's a lot of names. Um, I don't know. Uh, was that for Bank of America? Yeah. But... I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Um, to be fair, like, you didn't really get to meet other people. It was pretty much just, like, looking at... There was only one time there was, like, a group project with, like, six other people. We didn't really get to... It's mostly just looking at presentations this year because of COVID. Usually it isn't like that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, they asked about DCF. Yep, they asked about DCF in my conversion interview. And maybe just because, maybe they asked me because it looked like I knew and they kept pushing me and like I kept answering until I was like, I can't do this anymore. And he was like, um, well, I, mean, I, I answered and, he, and then obviously it looked like, you know, it was hard, but I mean, it was okay. It was kind of a case study. It was a good though. Oh, that was so hard because the Bank of America case study, instead of putting it on the screen, they just told me the facts and I, was, I had to like write them down. They gave, they gave me like 15 facts to work from. But anyway, yeah, that was painful. Uh, Bloomberg Insight Week, I'm pretty sure it's called Bloomberg Insight Week. The one I did is, is I mean, it's technically a spring week, but it's in the summer. I don't even know if Bloomberg has a spring, spring week. I, I, I don't know, but um, you can convert. I actually did convert for Bloomberg. They fast tracked me to like the final, like, interview for the internship but i said that i'm already doing an internship so i don't need to do that and um, what's the difference between insight day and spring week spring week is more like spring week is more 
I'm gonna say respectable. It's longer, obviously it's longer, it's a week compared to a day. But um, as spring week, you're usually, you're more likely to have a conversion opportunity at the end. And um, it's more, inside day is a taster, while well, a spring week is more of like, a, they're really showing you like what they do and stuff. But I mean, they kind of just, everything kind of just, you know, oh, you did a, you got, if someone says they got an inside day, they just say they got a spring week. It sounds better. How many spring weeks does an average person get into roughly? I do know that like lots of places get thousands of applications and they've only got like, you know, 40, 50 places or something. Um, I'm biased because I go to UCL and there's quite a lot of finance people here. So I know that, um, but on average, most people get like people that, I mean, I'm on average, if you just look at the stats, it'll be like 0 0.1 or something. But like, if you go to like university, you know, and you're actually trying maybe like one or two, I think some people, I mean, some people get, some people get really, really unlucky. It's like a, it's a numbers game, you know, um, some people get zero. I mean, some guy got nine, like this, it really, it, it really is a numbers game. Um, how many candidates were there at each of your spring weeks? I'm pretty, I mean, it's, it's around like 40. I'm just going to say 40, 40, 50. Bloomberg was like 40, I think. And I think that was actually kind of tough to convert because you had to like show effort. I surprised I converted, to be honest. If you get converted, do you commit to that firm because some internship you fight to others too? Okay, so you're meant to commit, but you can do it like you can renege, which is where you like cancel the contract. And it's not advised, it sets like a bad precedent. Like if you try to apply to the company you like broke the contract with, they'll remember that, you know. Um, but I mean, you're not meant to, no. You're meant to just stick with the, I mean, our people do it all the time. People like, they'll apply to a few others that are slightly better just to see. But I mean, um, I mean, it is a logical thing to do, but obviously the companies are going to recommend that because they gave you a place. And then if you like reject it, there's one less person and like, you know, they have to give someone like, it's confusing. Do you need to know math or finance? Yeah, you do. Um, is it possible to get internships in a company without a spring? By the way, you don't need to know like that much math. It's usually quite simple. If you're going into like advanced trading, like strategies, then yeah, you need to know your black shows, derivatives and all of that. But if you're going into investment banking, you're good with like a few formulas and stuff. Is it possible to get internships in a company without a spring week in the same company or other relevant ones? Yes, but it doesn't make it easier, it's harder. Um, spring week show interest and it shows that you're like because you got into a spring week it shows that you've already been through an application process and they selected you it makes you look good right um, so an internship they'll look at that and they'll be like okay we already said yes to him once he's probably good well that gives you a boost right and that's not for that company like if you do a spring week at your, um, UBS and then you go apply to Morgan Stanley they'll be like oh UBS liked them well, then Morgan Stanley is different levels, but um, no offense to UBS. Yeah, it's different. The, the UB, UBS, Barclays, HSBC, that's European banks, and then you've got the American banks. Um, not that that's relevant, but math helps lots of people. Yeah. Oh, if you meant like math degree, you don't need to do a math degree. Math, like knowing math helps, yeah. But like, what was, there was like a, music student from like Cambridge in like some spring or something I heard about like that yeah, as long as you show interest spring weeks are all about that like showing interest and stuff yeah bro I was so nervous um um well I so yeah so it, they, like some people on it from so early people that have been planning their careers since they were like 15 and I came to UCI I didn't even know what investment banking was um just get on it as soon as possible it it got bad for me like during november there were people getting offers from like the first companies like evercore maybe rothschild i think maybe Rothschild, i'm not sure but they were getting offers and i still hadn't even got like an interview and like that's stressful and it will stress you out but you just need to keep like grinding on it and eventually like you know you get you get like interviewed and stuff but yeah, no, you start on it as soon as possible. That will help with the nerves. As long as you're doing something about it, don't just sit there, you know. UCL is definitely a target university. Like, I think eight people from the Barclays people that converted are from UCL. 
Um, LSU kids are built different. LSU kids, LSU kids, I met a lot of LSU kids, right? Um, like my accommodation was an excellent LSU one, and fuck, like, all they talk about is their like financial careers. Um, is it, no offense to anyone that's going to UC, to LSE, um, great uni, and that is good for if you want to do well. But um, and I'm sure no, they do have fun as well. But um, some of the kids there are interesting. UCL target, yeah, uh, yeah, pretty much the target list. <laughs> Economics degree, yeah, it's kind of math heavy. Um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I've only done one year, but the maths last year was kind of hard, yeah. Which bank has the most spring interns? No clue. Um, I mean, the bigger ones are more likely to have more. Um, so, yeah, probably the bigger ones. But I don't, they don't really, you don't really see numbers for this stuff, you know. They don't really put, like, publish these numbers. Does going to a target university matter? Yes, but not as much as it used to um it used to be like if you didn't go to a target uni you're screwed but um now like you see people from like nottingham and like stuff that isn't traditionally target unis um like nottingham leads like you see as long as they show interest they like they, they get and you see a lot of people from non-target unis as well these days which is good and um yeah usually the people from non-target unis are in some like society and usually have a role there just the pattern I've noticed, so maybe that helps. Um, yeah, you're right. Goldman and Credit Suisse are the only that aren't non-rolling, and I mean, I got no idea why. They just, I mean, it, it is in a sense more fair. I don't know. Um, instead of first comes first serve, it's more of a who's better. But maybe they're dealing with um, summer internship applications right now, and they can't do that, so they just let them all at the end. So no one knows. It's just how they do it. Do you see some Indian universities get through? I haven't really seen any, to be honest with you. Um, I haven't really seen any. Um, the thing is, right, I'm sure there must be spring weeks in like Asia. So why wouldn't they just do them there? Like this is like most spring weeks that I've done like, like London and stuff, right? So it's a different geographical, okay, like that's a whole different. The most exotic we get here are like, um, Maybe an American student. No, but most of them are like um, you get a lot of like Spanish, Italians, French, lots of French people, loads of French people. Um, but yeah, yeah. Any other questions? When was your last application? Oh, when was your first? When was your last? First was like probably right sort of when I got to UCL, maybe the 1st of October, maybe something like that, early October. My last one was, so technically my last one was the Bloomberg one, but that was for the summer, like that was in the summer, it was a spring in the summer, don't ask me how that works. Um, and then, but the actual last one I did, I think was Barclays. So isn't it funny that the last application I did, I could have just said no, um, was the one that like, um, and that was like, maybe early January, because they open at different stages. I'm pretty sure they were one of the last ones to open. How long did you give yourself to practice online tests? I mean, I mean, I wasn't the most structured person in that sense. Like I did, when I got my hands on job test prep, I did quite a few, and then I would do as much as I could before each test. So if I had a Morgan Stanley test tomorrow, I would do Morgan Stanley the day before on job test prep and that says yeah it doesn't matter where you live as long as you can if it's online it definitely doesn't matter like i knew people in different time zones doing this shit and um do you and if it's in person as long as you can make it to the place should be okay how long after you submit your application do you set the online test it's usually 48 hours some give you five days something like that yeah Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a little tight time constraint. Do we have a bit of time between applying and getting an interview? Yeah, you get a lot of time. Um, 
I applied to Bank of America. It was one of the first places I applied, and my interview was in, in December. Like, I applied in early October, my interview was in December. And Bank of America is one of the few places that doesn't have online tests. Um, doing anything early gives you an advantage, to be honest with you. Um, I think online tests, just grind them out, like, tomorrow. <laughs> oh, it's whenever you can. Like, uh, you know, just get on it, like, soon. Um, it doesn't really give you an advantage. Like, as long as you've done all the content that you can get your hands on to practice, you can redo tests. But once you redo them, I mean, I've redid them a lot. But, like, if you redo a test and job test prep, it's the same question. So you're going to, it's easier for you. It doesn't make sense to do it again, you know. But, I mean... As long as you do them before you start applying and stuff. Yeah, it's more of a just do everything as soon as you can. But test, I, I would focus on my CV and cover letter before tests. That's just how I did it. Um, what are the benefits and advantages between going to London versus Canada? Like, like B B Birmingham, okay. Um, I mean, I don't even know how many places do um, Stuff, which isn't in London. I know like JP Morgan has stuff in Bournemouth, but I don't even know if they do Springs there. Most like all the accountancy firms have stuff elsewhere. Um, but I mean, you just want to be in London, you know, London's where it's all out. Like if you get a return offer, you'll get it for Birmingham. And there isn't much like, no only is paid likely to be less. Um, yeah, let's see what benefits like a Lumi for now. Okay, a couple more to touch. It's just better to be in London, to be honest. I don't really have a street. Like, not only is it that not really an option for a lot of places, London's just better. And uh, better just for opportunities in general. And I mean, look, like if you, on your CV, you've got like HSBC, um, like, you know, somewhere in the middle of Scotland, it's not gonna, uh, it won't look as good as London. It won't be a big deal, but it won't look as good as like, you know, London. Um, do the firms show your test score after you complete them? No, they don't. But they do, some do give you a report where they like tell you like how you did compared to other people. So they'll be like, you were above average, you were very above average or you were average. And, um, and then they also give you some like hints about your personality. They'll be like, oh, you are decisive, you are this, you are that, you are not this and this, you need to work on this. Morgan Stanley does that, I think, if you do. But yeah, um, yeah, no, that's actually a pity. But I mean, you probably don't even want to test like the most stressful thing. Yeah, but I just yeah, I just recommend drinking a coffee and just you know make sure there's no distractions and you just do the best you can. You know. Uh, hmm. If there's any other questions, let me know. All right, it looks like that's a wrap. Um, okay, thank you everyone for joining. Um, thank you Arturo, um, our speaker, for kind of telling us everything and teaching us so much about this. This was so useful, even for me, I found this super useful. Um, so thank you. And um, thank you to everyone for coming as well. Um, we're very grateful for you to join us. Um, and if you have any other questions, do follow Arturo. Um, I'm sure he's gonna have a flood of messages on his LinkedIn inbox. Um, so yeah, I'm sure Arturo will be happy to answer your questions. Uh, Arturo, anything you have to say? Uh, no, thanks for coming. Yeah, hit me on LinkedIn if you want that, any clarification. But yeah, thanks for coming. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Um, it's been great. Um, and goodbye. Oh. oh, wait, wait. What's my yeah. LinkedIn? Um, to be fair, just type in my name on LinkedIn. It'll come up. Maybe take some time to note his name down right now before, before yeah. everything finishes. Right. Well, okay. Remind me, Christmas. Cool. See you. Yeah. See you. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.